everyone. Uh, I know you guys have been now to a lot, so we're going to try to keep it as fun and engaging as we can. We've got a great family for that. Uh, I think that if you take it and if you know them, they will be giving you a lot of insight and also being a lot of fun. So, um, I mean, one of the things when it comes to journalists, national security, there was a reason when the Petit case started out. We were all fighting, there was a lot of excitement. I mean, a lot of us were a bit wary, but there was a lot of excitement, especially when we all were setting up the TV. Especially said, oh, you know what, you can't keep using national security as an excuse. To justify the attempt to national security or whatever to kill her. Now, the situation with this and journalists has long been tied to a lot of things. Traditionally, there is the idea that the OSA is a basically secret that that would be something which would be used in one of my colleagues' face to face from the dark, where national security would be used in one case. You can't even report in something. Then there were fighters, and the army would, okay, there was a big time that was against the army, but they were reporting on the It was again a centralized authority, and Indira Gandhi, we have a Narendra Modi today. The kind of government in power, then the kind of government in power now, these are the parallels. This is the condition under which national security is invoked. The laws are actually secondary to the political atmosphere that exists. The laws are just a manifestation of it. The reality is that all this stems from the kind of politics we find ourselves in. The, and I mean, we've encountered that at Caravan Court. Recently in Kashmir, one of our journalists tried to come today actually reported on how the army was organizing its own group. Uh, we have photographs of the army, the people getting down from army trucks, the army men helping them get down protest banners actually for the army in sort of different protests which will strengthen the Indian state's case. So, I mean, you cannot find any other reason to file a case. There has been quoted, everybody has been described to all journalistic work done. What do they do? They say that the people who have been named claim that they are now under threat from militants because they've been named in this. Uh, father is coming to the police. There is no law under which they can do uh, Tell your son to behave. If he doesn't behave, tell your son to come here. Uh, 
Shahid is summoned, that inquiry is still going on. Is there a law under which this inquiry is going on? Is there an FIR? Is there a complaint? Is there a hearing? We are still unclear, but that inquiry is under it. The kind of pressure that puts on every journalist who will report from Kashmir is quite evident. Uh, in the case of the farm protests, on the day the farm protests entered here, Navreet Singh died. We had eyewitnesses who told us that he had been shot. This was reported with the names of the eyewitnesses. For reporting this and contradicting the official versions, the edition case is filed against my colleague, the editor, Vinod Jones, and the owners of the other one. That's the edition case is proceeding as part of the case. During the Delhi riot, and I mean the Delhi riots are particularly bad example because, I mean, I know cases are proceeding in court today, but what has happened on the ground is that when your entire executive is compromised, I mean, the entire basis of prosecution itself is flawed. The Delhi police itself is behaving in a manner that cannot be justified. And again, I go back to this thing. If we had actually looked at 1984 and police conduct at that time and actually taken action, none of this would happen today. But our reporters who were on the spot, who were reporting, were beaten up by a right wing. At the same time, one of our reporters went to a police station where he was beaten up by the S. These are all cases that are proceeding. No action is taken today. This is all in the past when this kind of sustained attack on you. We have barely a handful of 10 or 12 reporters in the field of which 5 or 6 are facing these kind of things. And I'm just pointing out the most recent one. Just means that in reality, to do the job of journalism has been more difficult today than it has ever been at any point of time in our history. And national security is obviously the pretext. There is a danger, we are anti national, we are doing seditious things, etc. I so I think that's the just very big question because it's still something which seems is unprecedented. In the past, when there were attempts to harass journalists, or there were attempts to bring case against them, was it with this national security narrative around it? Because that obviously changes the, even for the public. You know, it's mo- much, going to be much more difficult to drum up support for the journalists if they're being accused of a national security threat. Do you feel that there's been an increase in that language? Or, you know, given there have been examples, as you said, from the past, what is the way in which the intimidation of journalists are not different? For instance, say, the weather is different, our cases are there. Well, look, so what we've seen, and I think it is, people are saying this quite correctly, we are seeing the Kashmirization of the rest of the country. In Kashmir, this was already common practice. What happened in Zubair's case, and Pratik was here, is that you are out in one case, five other cases are filed. In Kashmir, people have been behind bars for almost a decade where there is no case has been upheld. You are out, another case, out, another case, nothing is ever sustained. It's ridiculous. He gets bailed, there is a PMLA case that is happening. So we feel suddenly the national security discourse taken from the border where we were all content. A lot of the country was quite okay with what was happening in Kashmir as long as it was happening. In Kashmir now it has come home to everybody here and the same procedures are being used. So the second thing that has been used is the, I think Rebecca mentioned it, that at one point of time, journalists were considered immune from government sort of pressure. What this government has done is weaponize journalism against journalism. That is, prime time is devoted to castigating the few journalists who are doing their job. So already, the position of the journalist and faith in journalism has weakened. And then, at the back of that, if you put in the case of national security, then the public outrage is not... Uh, at the government, but it is at the journalist who is actually writing the truth. I think this gives us a good opportunity now to <laughs> go to the map to talk about the, um, the way in which these kind of laws are being used in this manner. Now, one really helpful, you know, to illustrate, I think, I think there's obviously been a bit of a discussion in the top of the UAP a bit, but maybe a little bit about the NFA and the CSA, you know, in Kashmir, since I think both of you already wanted to kind of get into that aspect of how Kashmir and even seeing this stuff and it's now becoming more and more new as well. So, how is it that, you know, what are the ways? Because, I mean, what, it's, it's one thing to define, it's just that, you know, the law is being misused. But are there aspects to these laws which are creating grounds for them to be in themselves? So it's not just about having a bad actor in the get to get to the police, but the way the law is framed itself is almost in white abuse. So one, if you could take us to something about that, some of the examples which we've seen in particular where you've seen this work and, you know, it's a bit turned into case in, in the scene, say, you know, not just the Taiwan journal, but even part of our case, a lot of that. And you know, is this whole way in which the law is being used to clear 
Just a couple of big ticket things I want to flag before I respond specifically to this. First, just keep in mind, uh, given what we are discussing here, and I suppose has been part of the conversation since morning, uh, I think we need to also find the category, and I think this is a task we're going to get, which is where we some particularly need to learn to do. We need to find language. Which communicates national security is state sponsored language. It's a language that we have adopted without any city. So we need to find changes that communicate people's security. Because national security does not mean our security. Uh, otherwise, the budget would look very different in the country. So let's find language to express our views. A place that we hear very often now, not just in on television, on Twitter, etc., but it has entered justice. And it has not entered this kind of language entry, judgment, and legal uh, discourse, legal argument. To my mind, it is extremely dangerous. And we need to be to all to it because, before you know, it could well be an offense for the international. And so we and I'm not joking. We know that there is an entire uh, process underway with the Ministry of Home Affairs to have an overhaul of criminal laws, including the Indian Penal Code and the Democratic Act, etc. So don't be surprised by what may come to mind. Uh, which brings me to the question that. Uh, what I asked about, um, you know, how do we look at this and which um, how to refer to. So for very long when we spoke about Kashmir or prior to that, uh, much more attention was paid to the Northeast where our spy sector was there and we used to talk of it as a state of exception, you know, using the Italian philosophy government uh, with the juridical uh, definition that we gave. Where is that state of exception today? And what is the exception today? And has that in any way featured into what is happening all over? And what do we need to, uh, you know, I think very rightly you have just pointed out some of us have been around uh, for a little longer. Do we need to revisit what was it that we didn't pay sufficient attention to? And are those processes, those practices today? Uh, have they been mainstreamed all over, including in laws, legal processes, and actions, particularly of the state and law enforcement agencies? Let us take a quick example. Um, Makasha mentioned the Pegasus matter, and the Chief Justice of that time, Chief Justice of India, Justice Raman, now said uh, that I have such so in an Iranian Queen judgment, which we know was about the internet shutdown. That national security is not a free pass that will be given to the state, and it will be subject to judicial review. It's important to recall that the state actually argued, and since I was representing Anuradha Basin, uh, and on the aspect of freedom of press and internet shutdown, we were making a connect. The state actually argued that this is a national security matter and therefore will not be subject to judicial review. That was a huge push the state tried to make. The court blocked it and said, no, these orders of suspension of the off internet, um, 144 orders, will be subject to judicial review, and national security will not give you a free pass. And that was the argument on which the Pegasus Committee was set up. We were asked as citizens to go ahead and give our devices, which many citizens do. The state, according to the court, refused to cooperate. Please understand what is happening today. You have a state that is constantly undermining, if not subverting the rule of law. Who is trying to keep the rule of law alive? It is the citizens who have been burdened with that. The state no longer wants the rule of law to be in practice. If the, if the state does not cooperate, 
what kind of adverse influences to be brought, what kind of legal consequences must follow, these are all questions that have been left open because the report has been seen. Hopefully, at some point, there will be legal explanation of that uh, report and the story will move forward. Uh, in Kashmir, for instance, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. There is, of course, a public safety act forever and ever. What do these laws to, to respond to the question that inherent in these laws, preventive detention laws, which as many of you who come from the field of law would be familiar, there is a discordant note. In fact, that is the word used in the question that can be asked. This is a jarring note in Article 22 of the Constitution, where very, very important legal rights that you will be produced before a magistrate within 24 hours. You have a, a right to have a lawyer of your choice uh, to represent you. You will be informed of your grounds of arrest. And right there comes preventive detention. So, the if it is you are arrested under preventive detention, then these rights will not apply. So, from the, from the time of the founding of the Indian Constitution, there was um, it, it, there was uh, uh, a heightened attention paid to issues of national security and state given that for preventive detention purposes. It's my understanding that that kind of attention to state having certain extraordinary powers over all civil liberties actually has an underlying presumption. The presumption being that. Uh, the state will act in good faith. The state will exercise this power only where required for quote unquote national security purposes. Everybody here can think for themselves how is that power being exercised. I'll give just three quick examples. Mia Kayum, president of the Srinagar Bar Association, was arrested as were many others when the application of Article 370 takes place. And in the High Court judgment, which actually makes fascinating reading, he was placed under Public Safety Act. And in the High Court judgment, the court says his ideology is like a live volcano. And therefore, it can never go still because he has this different ideology. And therefore, how can you say that now he will not act in this manner? He can always continue to act in this manner. And maybe he should consider whether he'll make a statement, etc., giving that up. The matter came to the Supreme Court. Mr. Rishon Dali and I represented Mia Kayum, and uh, similar questions were raised. And of course, we said our client is not going to make any uh, uh, declaration about his ideology. Then you have, uh, and you know that on the public safety act, without trial, without charge, you can be there for two years. We have Asif Sultan, journalist in Kashmir, has been arrested since 2018, if I'm not mistaken. What did he write about? He wrote about overground workers. I don't know that journalists, they need to write about a whole manner of things. It, it, what, they, what the state describes as overground workers. So he wrote about some militants and how increasingly young people are attracted towards militancy, both with our money. But we're going to write about this. Who are you going to communicate with? Who are going to the people you're going to talk to? Who are going to be your kind contact? So they say, oh, you were in touch with overground workers of militancy. If digital devices have been taken, and perhaps there was some discussion on digital devices in the earlier session, and of course, uh, nothing has yet been put in court, there's no charge, there's no uh, charges have not been framed. And of course, what is a digital device of a journalist going to hold? All the contacts, then you have cannot charge. 2011, an article was written, he's the editor of a news portal called Kashmir Wala. Somebody else wrote the article, he has a publisher, he has a li legal liability, undoubtedly. And he is now under PSA and UAPA. UAPA, which says, Adv advocates, advises, attempts. Section 13 and Section 18. I don't know what we are advocating here, but that's how broad it is. And no, it's not this government yes, did make some amendments of individual terrorists, etc., in the UAPA, but many of these, as uh, of course has pointed out, have actually a long legacy. This did not begin today. 
the state has been functioning in a certain manner. To be, it is not the web. The process is the punishment of the user. It is a phrase we use very casually now. I actually don't agree with that anymore. I think we've gone past that stage. It's not the weaponization of law. The law is the weapon. Law is no longer enabling. Show me any sphere of life where law is the enabling tool that we have. I fortunately, and I did have thought, we grew up at a time when law was used to enable, encourage, uh, enjoy, expand life. Today, law is not playing that part anymore. I mean, I know that we got some young students uh, from uh, law school, some from the energy school, which is like, unfortunately, it's just too perfect. I mean, when I went to law school, uh, I think, I mean, we were probably wrong, I think we were still working for the next 10 or 30 minutes. At that time, we still were thinking, you know, you know, this is, as you said, it's just enabling the case. The courts are not actually achieved that, and they can go back to this, and that's, and that's really not been happening. Now, one of the things that came up a little bit during the last, what are the interesting points, uh, which I think I remember and asked, but, you know, what, is, what was the actual origin? What funny thing is, the origin of the PMA was it even for terrorism, was it even for any other thing, for government? Because it was they it came out all the way to start in the 80s and in the 90s, and it was in 1999 when we started talking about it. So it was still, you know, your 9-11 and everything. And during the time when they came up with it, the statement of the public solutions only talks about brotherhood and why we need to talk about it. Because now it's just become this absolute catch-all uh, for everything. But what I want to ask you is, what we're seeing now is whether it's limited, whether it's now IT, the new IT, there's all these new ways in which you are seeing these laws which aren't even actually about national security are being used to now come out with it. The language still is a national security right So when they, when they went to put the PMLA case, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what, the reason why this is so important is money laundering is as bad as terrorism. This is, you know, the economic status of the country. Now, what kind of language do you tie that in to actually the case? What is the effect of the on journalists? Because, you know, they want to do their job. And obviously, most of them want to be able to do here, but they don't want to get into it. But it's a real risk, right? I mean, it is, we saw it with our case, we've seen it. So, how is that affecting journalists and their ability to pick up stories that affect them a more? How are you dealing with that in your mind? Two things that I think are very important. So, for me, actually speaking, the discussion of individual laws is a totally pointless issue. Let's not pretend that the law exists. Yeah, we we will eventually be able to maintain our commitments. But in fact, there is not enough. Nothing functions according to the law. We can discuss all we want, but in the future, and we are not very far from that situation. Often enough, as Vinda is saying, the lawyers, the legal process is now a means of defensive last resort. It is not an extension of rights. It is not an extension of. So, what is the impact of this in terms of journalism? Most of the impact has already happened. It's already around us. We were very different in our way. We were living mostly the same as this. What does it do? What we call media. We have to look at the power of the people. We have to look at the people. It's only a commercialization of journalism. It doesn't actually carry the intent of journalism. There's very little journalism that is being done. There's places where when it is being done, we are aware of the risk we are running. So there is no change. As long as we have the means to do it, we will continue to do it. What we are trying to do, apart from the individual threat, what we are trying to do is the institution. Because individuals to shut down individuals, which is why I think there is too much problem in emphasizing individual journalists, individual critical journalists, etc. That doesn't matter. Individuals can be very easily shut down. We are now trying to institutionally squeeze the money that is 
to represent and lead the 
uh, government of India at this time. In the past, it's been the Attorney General. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Banavati went twice on Pakistan's territory. He was the Attorney General in the last occasion, uh, if I recall correctly. And what do they, what is the field in the court that the court uses there in the international court? Constitution, Chapter 3, Supreme Court, all the judgments in which lawyers like me would be called all manner of names, uh, or, you know, applauding our work, would all be the ones they will cite there. So, his approach is absolutely right. This, uh, is still the largest democracy, but Chapter 3 is what they hang on to, and then functional, vibrant court legal system, and of course, whenever in doubt, Mahatma Gandhi. So, uh, that's, uh, that's what they, they hold on to, to save themselves in the international domain. Um, coming to the question that you asked about, what is yeah. the reason? So, whether they have any special protection, I think you infer from various judgments. Whether they are bail orders, even the Pegasus order, which actually talks about journalistic sources, because as we know, uh, court editors and others went to court in the Pegasus matter, I'm not mistaken, and Ram is one of uh, the petitioners. And the court notes that if this kind of uh, malware, uh, state surveillance, state scooping is going to take place, uh, journalists will not be able to do their work. So it, it actually notes that they have a special role to play. If you look at judgments during day, Arnab Goswami, Amit Devgan, um, Siddhi Kapan has just caught, Zubair, I think there is an underlying understanding of the targeting is happening because they are journalists. And therefore, while everybody should have a right to be, it's not as though they have an extraordinary right to be, and it's not written anywhere, either in the law or a judgment, but there is that you can't be going after people whose job it is. All of them are not actually calling out those in power, but whose job it is to call out those in power and ask the inconvenient questions. If you go back to the earlier emergency era judgments of Sakal Papers, Indian Express, where the state tried to control the production through, uh, you know, how many pages to be circulated in four duties, but again the court case, um, a certain amount of legal and said no state control will not be allowed. Coming back to another where is internet recognized as a fundamental right, where it connects with your freedom of speech and expression and right to practice the profession of truth? So I think you can read into certain judgments that there is a, an understanding, a judicial appreciation that journalists do need, uh, their liberties need to be protected in certain ways. Um, I think that, that's a very, that's something which, you know, also, I mean, this is, this is, between the course and the same time, there is also the fact that, you know, it's sometimes just a very long time before it goes back to the state back to the uh, I think one thing which I wanted to ask you about, you know, since we're talking now, we're going to kind of talk about how you deal with the success of the Both of you talk about the and there's the happening. How we are the best right? When is it happening? It's been for very long time. It's been like how many There were people who were doing it. Or was there not? All the languages that have to be used when talking about these things should have been and today, you know, uh, I once had to make this argument in the aftermath of the medical system. Should we now at this point start with the way we look at when, we, when journalists are reporting on this issue, we try to do it with as we talk about it. This is a question we say, and then we talk about the wrong, this is what this is what we say. Should we implicitly start from the answer of the thing that we are using? Should we, and should our language start to reflect these kind of things in these cases, where we, we Prevent the language in our system, the good forms of language in our system, allowing itself to become better in our own language and the language. You're really asking me this is a much larger question. Our power to resist or power to act is decided by the circumstances of our system. The way that our current circumstances meet up with the field also has to do with a larger problem that we as journalists or the country is supposed to face. It is 
Then you are writing against my team, I am not going to pay attention to you. I know the different public responses to both those stories. When we did the why are you doing those stories? What is your motive? You are anti-national. In five years, the very idea of public that must respond to that drives the democracy has been changed and manipulated to the point where you cannot expect the same kind of response. It's a problem that cannot be solved. Within the domains that we are, we must recognize that that doesn't stop us from doing what we do. But in there are some things that hopefully you know, John, this is going to be able to come up with that kind of language. There are some demands that we can make in the court. I mean, one of the things we talk about in there is some brief about it. You know, because you know the exact is not in the court. That neither the parliament nor the government are going to pass rules or laws for any more accountability or anything. The only thing, what is the point of the only thing that we can say is, Make requests for accountability to the court for when we take that part. Because if it's a file, we will start in jail. They get out. We heard a little bit earlier about how, for instance, malicious prosecution can only file after the female is an actual acquittal. So, this court is going to try to get the court to order a direct conversation whether it's taking the action rather than leave it up to the director to go to the court. So, is there any benefit? Is that a non-starter? Then try to get the court to try to bring in this one brief thing which you can do is ask them to make them perfect. And they'll scope for this and that happens. So we don't make demands from the court. At least lawyers don't. That would be a strange thing to do. They're not my bosses that I'm going to make demands. Of course we have. And this is a whole, look at the legal history of this country. It's very rich. And the court has not that uh, uh, old. We need to read legal history differently. Uh, how did all these rights come? The executive never gave us any rights. Let's get rid of these silly illusions about Parliament giving us rights. Even the 2014 Act was not given to women. People marched on the streets and got it out of the government. And that's how rights have always been got. Uh, and there are, uh, uh, you know, we saw that uh, the case of emergency where the Supreme Court 
changed its people and did not uphold the constitution that it had formed. And then, of course, after far too long, it returned with its mistakes. It's just that I don't think institutions can be allowed to apologize periodically. I think there's something wrong with that. So, uh, yes, this whole engagement and advancement of rights has happened through inside the court with people's struggles and social justice movement. And that's how the system of democracy works. Whether it is, you know, I have my friend Samana sitting here, who's a lawyer, she works on uh, uh, tribal rights, forest rights. How did those laws happen? Those kind of changes in law happen through social justice movements, yet we compelled to comprehend them. Neither the executive nor the court can be expected to be these enlightened people who are going to give anything. The fact that today malicious prosecution is an issue that has been repeatedly raised and in many fora. I remember addressing in NLUD about five years ago the issue of malicious prosecution where a Supreme Court judge of Sri Lanka was sitting. So these are new ideas that come into the legal domain and through judgment, through litigation, we actually advance ideas. And there is back and forth. There's no period, there's no golden age where everything was perfect in the court, at least it never is. And you will have some judgments which will be, uh, some of us may seem like they are not in keeping with the constitutional letter and spirit. So the court is the space of advancing rights, litigating, constantly raising new ideas. Accountability of the state is, to my mind, the key to everything. It was the, it's the key to, you know, uh, uh, that was referred to earlier parts of 84, etc. The issue of mass crime, the issue of accountability of state, for many of us uh, living in Delhi, started in 1984. What are the key questions we raised then, which we are raising till date? We didn't spring to life in 2002. Uh, our accountability of the state, this government says they want to decolonize the laws. Excellent. You pick up the Indian Penal Code. Please see which is the shortest chapter in the Indian Penal Code. Crimes by state. What is happening around you? Why are the public servants, those in state executives, those in state power, not being held accountable? Let's change the Indian Penal Code. But to what extent create accountability of the state? Creating accountability of state actors is the key to a democracy. And that is where we need to put our litigation. Thank you, guys. That was, uh, I think we've also, I think, spent over some time already. Uh, I do still want to see if you can just real quickly grab three questions in the audience. So, uh, I'm sorry that we, you know, this has gone on so late. But, uh, so, we have to find the three questions with, uh, Okay, okay, so uh, why did you ask uh, the young man there? Uh, thank you, Mr. Scott. You pointed out the use of language in the court. I really want to understand how the law clerk is in the court. I want to understand that. Do you want to take my name? <laughs> yes. And, uh, so I just finished the uh, element which is on constitutional morality. And in the last month of my work, there is an FCI judgment which says that it undermines constitutional morality if the state is not going to depend on the circumstances within the country and the institutions that are not there. Now, my question to you is very specific. You said you're a lawyer, right? You say murder, and then it says murder, does it go? We ought to be sitting in there. In this time, when we do what they really mean, I mean, this is coming into judgment. What is constitutional morality? I mean, I think no one wants to do it. Yes, for this, the gentleman says that there is an allegation against the social activist is more than murder. I mean, do we know what murder means? Is the profession still weak? Is this history so clear that we just tell everyone to come in and protect the human being? I 
you know, how again now do we in the media have to now, because as Vinda said, we can't be in a position where we're saying, oh, for this case, we are going to come out and be like, you know, this is a good thing or a bad thing and we can't. And how do we bring up the fact that, you know, there are journalists for whom this is happening and it's good and we have to make sure we are telling them. Also, you know, to be able to contact, to be able to contact, to be able to contact, you know what, it's good or nothing about it, but now what about you guys? It's like, Said and asking you, Vinda and Hatos, as people who've been in this field for a much longer time, you guys, are, you've been talking about how times are changing, conversations are changing, and how we as journalists need to be, need to continue that fight, so need to continue being independent. So, uh, my question to you, as a, somebody who's much junior to you in this field, in law and in journalism, what exactly? Do we do in the situation where speaking out is well? I mean, you know, if you're working independently, there is a state that could come after you. If you're working with some uh, media organization, then the state would come after your job. In that situation, and speaking purely as somebody in this particular line of work, how do you? What advice do you have for the rest of us who are following in your following in this field and much behind you in your footsteps? You know what Oscar Wilde said about giving good advice, right? Uh, and uh, don't follow in our footsteps. I mean, those are two cautionary warnings I would give you. Three. I I hear what you are saying, Anisha, and I know what you mean. Uh, it's a very difficult space, and yes, we need to do our jobs, and yes, people need to earn money, and they run their homes, and people need to hold on to their jobs. So none of us are living in Gaga land that let's all uh, do whatever we want and bring out our own little reporters and the journals. I'm not suggesting that at all. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, to go back to the question of language, I think it's interesting how we use the language today. Uh, there are multiple ways in which we can actually express ourselves. And being a lawyer, I, that's what I meant when I said it's, it's a challenging but exciting time. I feel that we also need to be, and, and it helps both in communication because if you're going to speak in a certain tone, you're already shutting out many, many people. And I don't want to shut out anyone uh, uh, from at least Listening to what I'm saying, they may disagree. That's entirely their prerogative. But how do you communicate? How do you write it? What are, what is the, what are the words you use? I think that helps a lot 
in no particular being able to, and as a lawyer, we are trained not to use language of a certain kind. And to ensure that the language states what we are saying without it being shrill, without anybody saying, oh, how did you say this, how did you use that? In fact, what's interesting is that those representing the state are actually repeatedly using language that cannot be used in the courtroom or should not be used or at least is unprecedented as having been used in the courtroom. Uh, so I think there is that space. And it is about, I really think this, this uh, battle is about a contestation of ideas about this country. It's going to go through a certain phase, but, you know, people are going to, there, there will be people who are, going, who, who are going back and forth from that sense. I know that there is a team, I agree, that team is large. But is it a static team? Are there others who are still trying to figure out what is happening, what is what we are thinking? I mean, so there is a there is a fluidity in the democracy which at least I am not giving up on. And uh, I think as journalists, as lawyers, we need to hone our skills of communication, both so that we are understood well and because nobody catches you out. If I may, and it's only a mild reprimand on the language you use, but we must not exaggerate the nature of the problem we are facing. Most journalists are not under threat of losing their job. Most the government is not coming after most journalists. Most journalists should exercise at least the limits of what they are allowed to do where they are. Unfortunately, that is not happening. Understand that the limits are different to the things being 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 The limits are different to the
and also teach us to feel bad and hopefully underscore all. So, uh, do let us know what you would like us to talk about, uh, what is the kind of kindness you think would have value to any conversation you would have, because to keep the monster robust and alive, uh, the law, lawyers, and the views, journalists, have to form an extremely valuable line so that we can continue to perform uh, all the other things that we do in a democracy that allows that to happen. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to all the people who support us. Thank you.